Welcome back. I'm Dr. Dai, and in this last video on photosynthesis, uh, we're going to be looking at the Calvin cycle. So once the solar energy has been transformed into ATP and NADPH and then and stored, the cell possesses the necessary fuel to create food in the form of carbohydrate molecules. These carbohydrates consist of a carbon atom backbone. So where does that carbon originate from? It's derived from carbon dioxide that's found free out in the atmosphere. That carbon dioxide's origin can be from uh, animals and other organisms uh, breathing it out, right, um, as, as waste from their own cellular respiration process. Um, and it's also produced by, uh, by human industry, right? Um, the term Calvin cycle refers to the photosynthesis reactions that utilize the energy amassed during the light dependent reactions. Um, and they're used to then produce glucose and other carbohydrate molecules. The Calvin cycle is named for uh, Melvin Calvin, who discovered the process. Um, in plants, carbon dioxide is taken in through the strom stromata. Um, it diffuses into the mesophyll cells and enters the stroma of chloroplasts. Um, this is where the Calvin cycle is going to occur, is in the stroma. Uh, this cycle is sometimes referred to as the Calvin-Benson cycle to acknowledge another scientist, Andrew Benson, who was also involved in its discovery. Uh, the Calvin cycle reactions can be divided into three main stages, fixation, reduction, and regeneration. In the stroma, along with CO2, uh, there are two essential components necessary to initiate the cycle. An enzyme called Rubisco and a molecule called ribulose bisphosphate, which we'll shorten to RUBP. Uh, RUBP, which has five carbon atoms and a phosphate group at both ends, combines with carbon dioxide through the action of Rubisco and creates a six carbon compound uh, that rapidly converts into two three carbon compounds in a process called carbon fixation. We're taking gaseous carbon and we're fixing it into a solid form. ATP and NADPH utilize their stored energy to convert the three carbon compound, three PGA, into another three carbon compound, G3P, in a reduction reaction that involves the gain of electrons. Uh, the resulting ADP and Na D plus molecules are cycled back to the light dependent reactions for re-energization. All right, so that's when we talked about the shuttling. All right, one of the G3P molecules exits the Calvin cycle to contribute to the formation of carbohydrate molecules, typically glucose, uh, which is gonna contain six carbon atoms. Uh, consequently, it takes six rounds of the Calvin cycle to synthesize one carbohydrate molecule corresponding to each fixed carbon dioxide molecule. The remaining G3P, uh, it's gonna participate in the regeneration of RUBP, uh, priming the system for the next round of carbon fixation, uh, with ATP being employed during that regeneration step. So let's summarize that. We have, um, we're gonna fix six carbon atoms from CO2 and that's gonna require six rounds of the Calvin cycle, six turns of the wheel, uh, and it's gonna require energy input from 12 ATP molecules and 12 NADPH molecules during the reduction stage, along with six ATP molecules during the regeneration stage. Photosynthesis, which we know is a fundamental process shared by all photosynthetic organisms, uh, has remained largely unchanged throughout evolution. Uh, it involves photosystems capturing light energy and utilizing electron transport chains to power the assembly of carbohydrate molecules in the Calvin cycle. However, environmental conditions have led to adaptations that introduce some interesting variability. So dry climate plants, for example, have evolved the ability to conserve water. They efficiently use CO2, enabling photosynthesis even when CO2 is scarce due to closed stromata on hot days. Uh, so additionally, they conduct their pr uh, preliminary Calvin cycle reactions at night to conserve water, uh, allowing minimal photosynthesis without opening the stromata during extremely dry periods. So the plant, uh, 
kind of opens and closes itself depending on environmental conditions so that it can conserve as much of its water as possible and not risk drying out. Um, we see this with cactuses and some other succulents. Really, really interesting adaptation. All right, so we've discussed the two phases of photosynthesis in chloroplasts, uh, but what about prokaryotes, right? We mentioned that they can do photosynthesis as well. And things like cyanobacteria, they, they don't have membrane-bound organelles, so what are they doing? Um, they utilize plasma membrane infoldings. So no, they don't have membrane-bound organelles, they just use just their outer plasma membrane to do the process. Uh, and they attach chlorophyll pigments directly to their outer plasma membrane. Uh, and that's how they do their photosynthesis. So instead of happening inside a contained organelle, it's happening freely inside their cytoplasm. Um, all right, so the energy cycle. Living organisms obtain energy by breaking down carbohydrate molecules. So why would plants which produce carbohydrates need to break them down? Well, carbohydrates serve as the universal energy storage molecule across all life forms, whether you can do photosynthesis or not. Uh, while ATP can store energy, uh, it's, it's rather uh, unstable and there's a lot of heat loss involved. And maybe you remember when we talked about how we can't have a lot of free energy hanging out inside our closed cell system. Uh, it'll overheat and cause damage. So we need to be able to store that energy somewhere where we can readily access it, but it's not gonna burn, if you will. Um, and carbohydrates are, are those molecules, especially glucose. So photosynthetic organisms, uh, well, including plants, they have mitochondria and chloroplasts. They need to be able to do both processes because they have lots of re other reactions that are gonna need ATP as well throughout their cells. So we have photosynthesis to produce that sugar molecule to store all of the plant's energy. And then we're gonna have mitochondria that are gonna go ahead and do um, oxidative phosphorylation, aerobic respiration, uh, to produce ATP for that plant. All right. So you might have noticed that photosynthesis's overall reaction is six carbon dioxide, six water, and that converts to six glucose plus six oxygen. It's the reverse of cellular respiration's overall reaction, which is six oxygens and six glucose molecules that then get broken down into six CO2 molecules and six water molecules. Uh, photosynthesis produces oxygen as a byproduct, while um, respiration is going to produce carbon dioxide as a byproduct. And they're just gonna keep cycling around. Um, in nature, nothing is wasted. Every atom is conserved and endlessly recycled. Um, substances change form or shift between molecules, right? Uh, first law of thermodynamics, but nothing vanishes. So CO2 isn't a waste product of respiration, just as oxygen isn't a waste product of photosynthesis. They're byproducts that move on to other reactions. Um, photosynthesis harnesses energy to construct carbohydrates and chloroplasts, while aerobic cellular respiration uses oxygen to break that carbohydrate back down and release its energy. Both organelles employ electron transport chains to generate that energy for the reactions, for other reactions, excuse me. Um, it's really, it, it's quite beautiful if you can think about chemical reactions that way. So thank you so much for joining me as we explore photosynthesis, uh, and hopefully I will see you when we move on to chapter six. Thank you so much.